Thank you. No, note to self, don't get scheduled around lunchtime. Okay, so uh, first of all, I'd like to just say thank you for those that are here, because I know that there is a lot to see. Um, so I appreciate you uh, taking the time out, uh, especially since the only reason I'm being let loose on this is because we paid Madfest a bucket load of cash to let me up here. So, um, uh, <laughs> so if you don't like it, <laughs> there's nothing you can do about it. <laughs> so we are, we're going to talk about, oh, it's good, look, it's filling up, it's nice. <laughs> we're going to talk about the concept of reality the very nature of your reality and what's going on. Uh, obviously only from an advertising marketing perspective, let's not forget what we do for a living or why we're here in the first place. Um, I would like to say, sort of, a sort of apology, there is later on in the deck a kind of whiff of sales. There's a slight sales element to what we do, um, but I promise to make it so casually entertaining that you won't even realize that I'm actually selling you stuff even though I've literally just told you that I'm going to be selling you stuff. This is sort of next level Darren Brown type stuff. So, if there's one thing that books and films have taught us is that there are multiple realities happening at any one time, all at the same time. Okay, now that means that there is a reality where my kids tidy up after themselves. There is a reality where I took my career a lot more seriously, a lot younger, and I've already retired, and I'm currently traveling around the world somewhere. There's even a reality where I don't look good in a waistcoat. <laughs> this is not that reality, people. <laughs> but the problem is, we think we know the reality we exist in. We think we know the rules of the reality we're in. Okay? So, on a simple level, who buys nappies? Who, who, who purchases nappies? Men or women? Predominantly. Women. women, predominantly. Let's be honest. We've made some improvements, men, but we've not improved that much. Right? So it is predominantly women. What are we saying? 80-20? Is that being too generous on men still? Yeah, 90-10. Let's go 90-10. Okay, age, age range. What's the average age range of people buying nappies in the UK? Any ideas? 25? 35, it's a bit, it's, that's, that's about, so the average age in the UK for a person to have their first child is 29.6. So if we're talking about who buys nappies, we are looking at predominantly women aged between, say, 25 and 35 to 40, okay? Seems realistic. Not if you're in Japan, it doesn't, where the sale of adult nappies now actually outsells baby nappies. And this is the problem with the world around us. I don't mean incontinence. I mean, that is obviously a problem. But what I mean is, we have this narrow view of the world. And while we look through this narrow prism, we won't see the bigger things around us. And that's vital when it comes to uh, delivering our marketing messaging. And that's long before we get to the point that we've got to go to work in a nappy. So, over the, next, the rest of this presentation, it's time to unplug from the Matrix slightly, to paraphrase a film that some of you are way too fucking young to remember. But... Uh, <laughs> You can either take the blue pill and just stay doing what you've done forevermore, okay? Or you can take the red pill, we can start digging into some data, see what the reality is, and see how far the rabbit hole goes. All I offer you, as Morpheus said in that film, is the truth. Okay, massive stat alert. Now, we've all kind of got a little bit wary of big stats. I spent over 10 years in new business for a media agency. I know how much massaging goes into a big number that goes on these slides. The crucial thing about this, though, is whatever data source you are using, make sure it's broad. So at Sakana, we have over 80% of all the FMCG transactions in the UK. It's quite a lot. But what that gives you is a full understanding. It is that breadth of things. The other thing you need for your data source to start to understand your reality is make sure it hasn't got any cookies, because that is coming, and if you just carry on the way you've been doing things, eventually things will get bad. So don't wait for someone to switch the lights off before you find a torch. Now, everybody at the minute, particularly on this stage this morning, because it seems to have been the main theme, is totally losing their shit about retail media. Now, if you think I'm about to do a huge but about retail media, I'm not. I think it's great. But what you need is collaboration. Retail media gives you an amazing insight into the view of that consumer. 
In this case, a woman who appears to be about to make fruit sandwiches. No idea why. But again, what you need is that breadth. You need a full market view, he said, having picked an unsplash image of a full market. <laughs> Other images were available, but you had to pay for them. <laughs> Gotta love unsplash. Again, you need that breadth. You need that full understanding of your market. Now, at Sakana, and this is the bit where it might get salesy, or does it? It does. Um, we work in the FMCG category. And what we have is the EPOS data, so every single thing that is sold through the till by SKU level, so for those of you who aren't in the room, that means just individual level, uh, by week, by store. So the collective noun for it is a shitload. It is a shitload of data that we get every week. That means that we can see not just what's happening in the supermarkets, but what's happening in kind of independent stores, which means you can look at how do people respond to a Coca-Cola ad? Do they go out to the supermarket and think, before they go, I'm going to buy a massive two and a half litre bottle? Or what is it that goes through your mind on a boiling hot day when you've taken eight hours to get into this place because it's oversubscribed, and you're like, I'm really thirsty. What drinks will I have while I'm queuing? But why? What's the fucking point? Why? Why do, why do we care about this? Well, ultimately, the situation is that technology, the ad tech out there to deliver your advertising message has gone far in advance of the planning data that tends to be going into delivering your message. And that means you are leaving money on the table. Or in this unsplash case, you are leaving it in a giant little money jar. Um, understanding where to put your budget on a granular level is going to be vital. And there are various ways that you can look at doing it. Now, this, this bit is I'm going to talk about what we do and how we work with our clients. But the principles remain the same. So whatever industry you're in, whatever products you work across, that using that full data set uh, and that sales data to understand the picture of your world and understand the parameters of your reality is vital. On a simple level, geographically, we still look at the UK and just go, oh, we'll do UK, all of it, as though everyone's the same. I live in Scotland, trust me, it's not the same. They're very different people. Um, or we talk about regions or even conurbations. And actually, even within a city, even within a small area, different postcodes have a different kind of attitude, different people living to it. And, and they shop differently and they think differently. Uh, and your opportunity in those places will differ massively. So you need to kind of make sure that you get it right on a granular level. And the tech is there to do it. Now, this picture represents two things to me. It represents most of the 90s, where I wandered around the supermarket, clutching a bottle of wine, desperately looking for crisps, wearing a coat that I thought made me look pretty cool, but in fact made me look like a bit of a dick. <laughs> the other thing it represents is distribution. I spent a long time working in uh, media agencies. I worked with lots of small uh, FMCG brands. But across the board, distribution is never taken into account in the planning of an advertising campaign. And actually, if you spend money convincing people to buy your product when they can't go to a shop and buy your product, not only are you wasting money, but the end result is you piss them off. Weirdly, consumers blame you if you get them excited about something that they can't then go and buy. So making sure that you can tie in your data to the distribution and understand where you should and shouldn't put your message, purely based on the logistics of if someone can respond to that ad, again, will make a big difference from a financial perspective. Sales data also gets you away from the messy world of people, right? Because if you are working with a media agency, let's say, let's say I've invented a brand new premium product that's very ethically friendly, right? It costs a lot of cash, but it literally takes carbon out of the atmosphere while you're eating it or using it. Okay, so I would go to a media agency and go, who's my audience? And they would build up uh, a, an audience using something like TGI, okay? And it would be people that agreed with statements like, the environment is very important to me. I would definitely pay more for environmentally safe products. Or I check the background of all my shopping. 
and it would build up an audience of people and it would say, right, turns out there's 25 to 55-year-old women that have got two cats and they go on a called Gerald and they live mostly around the area of Kent. And you go, great, let's advertise to them. The problem with that is twofold. First of all, TGI and all these sort of things, it's panel data and it's modelled up. I have watched planning campaigns come up with the most ridiculous stuff, namely because it turned out that the question you were basing the plan on has been answered by six people, two of which probably had quite a serious meth habit. <laughs> it doesn't give you an, actu an accurate prescription of what you're looking for. The other problem is it's declared data. It's what we say we would do. And we lie. Oh my God, we lie all the time. Actually, we don't just lie. We have a cognitive dissonance between who we think we are, like how good a person we think we are, and how good a person we actually are, right? Or I guarantee if we did a survey after this and asked every single person in this room would go, yeah, I'd pay more for environmentally safe products. Hell yeah. Till you get in the supermarket, you're like, fiver? Fucking fiver? I'm not paying a fiver for that. As you reach for a 95p bottle of bleach and silently hear the fish scream, probably not silently if you live near Thames Water. How the hell do we do this, you ask? Well, I'm going to tell you, because that's what we've paid the money for to have me here. It's very simple the way we work. As I say, to quote the BBC, other data providers are available. They're not as good, but they're there. Uh, we look at a category and we look at a brand and we compare the trends within the category and how the brand does. Okay, And this enables us to break the entire UK down into areas that are either opportunity, so where you can get the easiest return on investment, Maintain, which is where you're getting your fair market share, but you need to, to keep that position. Or limit, where actually either distribution is a problem, or for example on here, if you have a low share of a category that is declining, it's going to be pretty difficult for you to drive a return on investment with your money. And what we can do is then break down the entire UK like that. Ooh, it's good, isn't it? Hey, look at that, tiny little areas, rather than just the whole of Manchester likes crisps. Um, we can write that. If you want to come and see this in augmented reality, pop by our booth uh, by the Freema Leaders Bar. We've got like we've got a cool app. We've spared no expense at this event. Okay, so that's one thing: planning data. Use your sales data to understand what's real and plan accordingly. But there's no good planning if you don't measure at the back end. Now we do measurement on sales, so we are looking at sales metric. Not kind of things like propensity to buy or brand love. Now, I know that they are metrics, but they annoy me. What do you want from that campaign? I want people to love my brand 10 points more than they did before this ad run. Okay, what does that mean? Nothing. doesn't mean anything. It's bullshit. Measure the sales. Get some hard numbers behind it all. Okay, and what we do is just simple A-B testing methodology. We look at what happened before so we can see what happens when you change it. Okay, so in this example, you can see the control and the test. And the stores match each other. So we've matched the sales patterns to understand what happens before you advertise. Then, when the advertising campaign starts and you see that differentiation, you can tell that that is the effect that the advertising is having because everything else has been modeled for. Amazing. But make sure you go completely down the rabbit hole because actually it's really easy to just kind of look at one thing. So for example, if you are advertising, if Nike advertised a pair of trainers, they're not just advertising that pair of trainers, they are advertising Nike and everything else that goes along with it. Just the same in an FMCG world, if we measure something for Filippo Barrio pasta sauce, okay, then you need to measure what impact that has on their olive oil and their vinegar because they are advertising their brand as a whole. And if you don't measure across, then you are doing yourself a disservice in understanding the impact and the reality that your advertising has. Also look at the category, because understand how does your brand function within that? So do you still share? If, you, if, if Filippo Barrio does pasta sauce, does Dolmio go down? Does Own Label go down? Or do we all just see an ad and go, spaghetti bolognese, that's a great idea. I've made that for ages. And we just reach for the nearest one, and everybody benefits. So understanding how you function within that is crucial to understand true return on investment. Then you can start being quite funky and start testing out different hypotheses. See if what you think is real is actually real. Who is your audience? You might kind of go, well, we just know. It's 18, 25-year-old men. We know that. But have you ever actually seen what happens if you advertise to 18, 25-year-old women? 
Using multi-cell testing, you can do low-cost inventory to test a theory. Does it work out or not? Are you wasting money showing people an ad 10 times when it turns out they only need to see it four before they go, that's great, I want that? Or the other way around, are you wasting them showing it four times when it turns out that the people in question that you're speaking to are really quite stupid and they need to see it at least 10 times before they go, oh, it's a pair of trainers. We do lots and lots and lots of these different tests and it gives us a way to kind of see in. So in some instances, in this instance for example, you'll see at the end there, we, taste, we tested the nature of time. By that I mean we tasted the nature of how much was you, was you? Jesus. How much were you influenced by seeing something at the right time? So in this instance, a bar of chocolate. So if you saw a bar of chocolate at a time when you were more likely to buy a bar of chocolate, would you respond on that impulse? Or do you need to build it out over time? Turned out, the time testing worked better. The creative testing. We ran a campaign to see if we ran the hero product as normal on its own, and then the hero product with another product from the range. Would we create a halo effect or would we just cannibalize one for the other? Do it on low cost inventory, and that means you don't get to the end of the year and go, we spent eight million pounds on an out of home campaign, and it turns out that all we did was just nick our own sales. All of these are ways to look at that. And so, I'm gonna wrap up there. That's the nature of our, our presentation on sales and using sales data for reality. There is one more thing. Now, I did say at the start about it being sort of like Darren Brown, and it's more Darren Brown than you realize, because throughout this entire deck, I have, in fact, been hypnotizing you so that, and admittedly, it was ill-advised in the opportunity, but if you see, at any point, a surprise monkey, you will immediately want to come and see us in our cabana by the bar and tell other people to do so. Thank you very much. <laughs> Gordon, outstanding. Thank you very much. As ever, entertaining and insightful. I didn't know that Champagne Socialist was actually an audience category, but I think it's something we can look into. Oh, we can definitely look into it. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions uh, to ask Gordon while we have him here? I think you've covered it all there, Gordon. Excellent. Well, thank you very much again. Another uh, round of applause for, for Gordon. Thank you very much. <laughs>